Why do we have to have Black History Month? I know no one has ever heard someone groan that question out before, right? Why do some people, now I say it that way, why do some people have to have special days? Why do we have to have Black History Month? Why do we need to have Hispanic heritage celebrations? Why do we need gay and LGBT pride marches? Why do we need Women's Day? Why do some people need to have special days? Well, there are a lot of reasons. But the basic reason is that when you live in a country that for most of its history has tried to forget your story, or put your story down, or write your story for you on terms that keep you down and abuse you, then you need occasions to tell your story for yourself. To celebrate who you are and what your forebears endured and in church to give God the glory for getting them and you through it all. A few centuries ago, some of the Christians in Europe, not all of them, some of them, decided that they didn't need to listen to Jesus' teachings about love for other humans and could ignore the Lord's teaching this morning to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. They decided a few centuries ago that lust for gold was a higher calling than the love of God. And they decided to participate in an ancient institution practiced on nearly every continent, an institution called slavery. But their slavery wasn't the kind that you might see in ancient Egypt or, or Carthage or Greece or Rome or Ethiopia or Judea, where oftentimes slaves were not only literate but were teachers in wealthy households, where slaves were regularly freed, where that was not determined by your race or the color of your skin, and where it was not considered a genetic attribute, where slavery was something that affected a particular person, not one generation after the next in an endless cycle of oppression. No, the slavery uh, these Christians of old concocted was a different and more peculiar kind of bondage, one decidedly more hopeless than the pharaohs of Egypt or the, or the kings of Israel or the, the emperors of Rome might have ever dreamed up. It was one where slaves kept in bondage weren't even seen as humans. Unless it was time to decide how many members of Congress your state was going to get or how many electoral votes Master's State was going to get to cast. It was a cruel and hopeless and wicked institution. Sure, there were some Masters who were kinder and gentler than others, and yes, at one point it was illegal to free your own slaves, even if you wanted to, and some Masters kept their slaves and treated them exceedingly well, given that they had no other choice. Quakers in particular did this. There are always extenuating circumstances, and there are always gray areas, and there are always complicated details to every story. But at the heart of the matter, at the very core of American slavery, at the very soul of that institution, was the premise that it is okay to completely ignore the desires and will of another person and use them against their will as your own property, as your own workhorse, as your own housemaid, and your own object of sexual desire. That's known as rape, by the way. And this led to segregation later on, which is justified by philosophies and theologies based not on reason, but on years of dehumanizing a race of people, which led to irrational fear, hatred, and prejudice on a national scale. Now, they like to blame the South for it, but believe me, there's racists everywhere. Amen. Now, it's one thing to have a maid, or a farmhand, or a lover. It's another thing to do it against someone's will and then come up with every kind of convoluted reason imaginable to justify the unjustifiable, to try to ease a conscience that should feel guilty, to try to calm a soul that ought to be troubled for the way it treats others. You see, we have to have Black History Month because of the lingering cruelties in our society from those actions taken long ago and not so long ago. Racism people aren't aware of that's just present in their minds and the, the deep damage done to African American communities because of the lack of historical opportunities to succeed in the same way that others have. You can think about it as having a really bad sickness and having to get over it. Just because recovery has started, it doesn't mean you're 100% healed yet. That's where we are as a nation now. We're still in the recovery process, still taking those steps onto 
100% healing and praying. Praying to God Almighty, we don't do any more damage. You see, we have to have Black History Month for another important reason. We have to have Black History Month not just to talk about the wrongs done, but to lift up those people of African descent, those, those great ancestors who bore the brunt of kidnapping and forced servitude, who generation after generation maintained their dignity and their wit and their intelligence and their spirit in spite of the world's best efforts against them, who taught their children songs and rituals and stories of their ancestral lands, just like the ancient Hebrews did in the Psalms when they were taken captive by the Babylonians. You see, we have to have Black History Month to honor those who, in spite of every imaginable hardship and then some, overcame. They overcame hate. They overcame oppression. They overcame cultural destruction. They overcame attempted, I said attempted, spiritual desolation. They overcame wave after wave after wave of hardship and difficulty and made a new life in a new land just as that new nation refused to deliver again and again and again on a basic human promise. Those ancestors demanded better. They demanded justice. They demanded a higher standard from their nation. It's their nation now and from the nation that was their home. They demanded that their nation treat them with the same dignity and respect as other groups were getting. That's not special treatment. That's basic fairness. Amen. You see, we have black history to honor those who might have been doctors, inventors, or writers, or innovators, but were denied the possibility because of the color of their skin. And we have it to deny those who were still healers and innovators and writers and artists, even within the restrictions of their own time, and they're not given their proper due. We have Black History Month to honor those who seize the moment to do something new and great with their lives and change the world forever by simply existing without shame over something they couldn't change. The color of their skin. Amen. Black History Month is not about telling a one-sided story and it's not about demonizing white people. Amen? <laughs> it's about making sure we remember the whole story. Because for a long time in this country, the powers that be actively ignored this part of the story. And we just might do it again if we're not diligent about it. We have Black History Month to tell the story of how victory was won again and again and again. We have Black History Month to tell the story of human strength and power that rests within the human soul when the forces of this world are stacked against you again and again and again. And that's something that can inspire anyone. I don't care who you are or where you're from or what you look like. We have it to honor the forgotten whose names we may never know, those who died young and old, those whose names we do remember for the great things they've done, and those whose names history tried to forget. But they're coming to light now, and they're being honored for the work that they did to build a better and more just and more grace-filled world. And there is nothing more Christian than a story about life overcoming death. Amen? Amen. About grace overcoming violence. Amen? Amen about love overcoming hate. Amen? That's what the gospel lesson is about today. Jesus talks about loving your enemies to a degree that most people will never fully realize. And to be honest, to be really honest, if you sit down and really think about an enemy, think about the person you hate most in the world or the person you would hate most in the world if you let yourself hate other people. If you really think about that person, Jesus is telling you to love them today. And if anybody but Jesus told you to do this, you'd ignore them and call them crazy. And if most of us are honest, and you're in church now, so be honest. If most of us are honest, we're tempted to do the same thing to Jesus when he gives us this teaching. And I know that because I see how people behave. And I know that because I face the same temptations myself. But nothing keeps the cycle of hate going like piling more on top of it. Nothing keeps the cycle of oppression going like struggling in futile anger. If we struggle only in anger, then we're always in the negative. 
Let your anger and your frustration and your temptation to hate something or someone be transformed into love. Not just anger as what is, but a strong love for what could be. That was Dr. King's dream, the undying love of what people might be if they could just learn to get over themselves. That was Jesus' dream for us too. You name it, these major, these major figures in history who taught love and preached compassion, they realized something. The future has everybody in it. Whichever side of history your ancestors were on, that does not have to be your lot in the future. The future has everybody in it. The future belongs to everyone, and there's no segregation that will stop that train. There is no deportation that will stop that flow. There is no psychological damage or physical harassment that you can do to change that fact. And if everyone is in it, then that means it belongs to everyone, black, white, and whatever else. And if it belongs to everyone, then we had better figure out how to move forward together. Now, I am going to take a moment and say, I get that it is a strange dynamic to have a white person discussing the appropriate uses of black anger from the pulpit. <laughs> but odd dynamics are sort of come with the territory around here. So let me just say as your spiritual counselor, I'm not saying don't ever be angry. I'm saying don't only be angry. Amen. When you let that kind of negativity define your relationship with others and with the world and with its history and with your history, no matter what it is, you'll start to let it define your relationship with God and with yourself and with your future. And one day you'll find that you're fighting one nightmare with another. Jesus calls on us to fight the worldly nightmare of abuse and oppression and hatred, not with more of the same, but with a dream. Not a nightmare, but a dream with a vision of something more beautiful than what history has handed us and of a path brighter than our ancestors ever knew. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is an offshoot of love, just like prejudice is an offshoot of hate. So in place of hate, have love. Because when you have love, you have power. You have power to declare over the past that you will honor it, that you will lift it up, that you will learn about it, and you will respect it, but that your future is not the same as your past. Tomorrow is not yesterday, that the next decade will be better than the past decade, that the next century will be brighter than the past century, and the next kingdom... The next kingdom will be far, far better than any human nation on this earth because that kingdom is of God and from God, not just one nation under God. Amen. And a bold person, a really bold person, a person who's bold like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were bold. A person who's bold like Absalom Jones and, and Howard Thurman were bold. A person who's bold like Thurgood Marshall and Polly Murray were bold. A bold person will stand up and declare and will walk this earth over and believe that the next kingdom and its blessings are not just some far off event, but start right here and now. Don't believe me? Jesus said it. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's in our hands. It's in yours and mine. It was in the hands of our ancestors, though some of them let it slip through their powerful fingers while others held onto it with a rough and weary grip. It's in the hands of every child born today, and it will be in the hands of every child born tomorrow, and every year after that for all time until the end of time when that kingdom reaches its perfect completion. That kingdom is in our hands because we are in God's hands. And if we are in God's hands, then we all belong to God. And if that's the case, then we all belong to one another too. Amen. So, instead of wondering why we have to have things that honor historically mistreated groups like Black History Month or Pride Marches or Hispanic Heritage Celebrations or Women's Day, why not just be glad that we get to have them? Amen. Take those stories into account, alongside with the stories of the Scotch-Irish who, who settled in the mountains and grew big, awesome beards and made beautiful quilts. 
of the French who settled down in Louisiana or the Italians who settled up in New York and made some of the best food you will ever put in your mouth. Amen. Why not be glad that we get to be together and learn more about one another and learn more about the stories of the people who came before us and worked so hard so that we could sit together in the same place without having to go to jail for it. Amen. It wasn't that long ago that this was a crime. Rejoice that forgiveness and love are winning out over bitterness and hate. That real power is winning out over cowardly abuse. And take your place in that grand story that is still unfolding before you and wrapping itself around you because that story is God's story. Amen. And that story is your story too. And to be part of that is to belong to something, and it is to mean something, and that tells us something important, that we belong and mean something to God. Amen. Why don't we remember that we belong to each other and try meaning something to one another, too? Amen. Amen. Amen.